What's the connection between law and justice in natural law thinking? Legal positivism asks the question every law student and lawyer wants to know the answer to. Where can I find the law? It answers that question by seeking to identify the sources of law. Natural law asks a different question. How does law work as a social institution? Why should and do people obey the law? The answer natural law gives to the question why people obey the law is that although some may obey the law because they fear the punishment that would result from breaking the law, and others obey the law because they've got in the habit of doing so, lawmakers want people to obey the law because they think that the laws are just. The best reason for obeying the law is that you believe that the law is just. Natural law says, therefore, law is a rule which claims to be just, a rule which carries with it the claim that obeying the rule would be the right thing to do. A rule which makes no such claim is just a threat. Although H.L.A. Hart was a legal positivist, he gives a good example of the distinction when he talks about a command issued by a gunman to a hostage. Such command is not a law. Anglo-American legal positivists have tended to assert that natural law theory claims that positive laws are presumptively just because they're presumed to be derived from natural law and therefore to be imbued with God-given authority. That view comes from William Blackstone, who smugly asserted that the common law of his day reflected the natural law. But it's not a necessary part of natural law theory to make a claim that positive laws are presumptively just. Instead, natural law theories measure the justice of laws against an objective standard. That standard is, as Fergus Kerr explains, objective, accessible in principle to reason, and based on human nature. The idea of such a standard uh, goes back as far as the Roman thinker Cicero and beyond. Cicero thought that discerning the right, jus, was a matter of interpreting, right, interpreting rightly the way the world is, natura. It's a matter of right reason ratio. Laws are therefore, for Cicero, rules formulated by rulers through the use of right reason for the common good. In Christian thought, the natural law defined the basic obligations that a person owes to God, to their neighbour and to themselves. And the clearest expression of these obligations was taken to be the Ten Commandments. This was the view of the medieval theologians and of the reformers Luther and Calvin. The Lutheran reformer Philip Melanchthon developed from this idea ten principles of natural law. First, worship God and honour God's law. Second, protect life. Third, testify truthfully. Fourth, marry and raise children. Five, care for one's relatives. Six, harm no one in their person, property or reputation. Seven, obey all those in authority. Eight, distribute and exchange property on fair terms. Nine, honour one's contracts and promises. And ten, oppose injustice. Now, because of the effects of the fall on human's ability to discern and obey the natural law, we need positive laws to spell out how we should act. In addition, the general principles of natural law must be further articulated and supplemented according to the specific needs of individual communities. Laws can be measured against the standards of natural law. Laws which contradict those standards are either to be treated as defective laws or as not laws. For some natural law thinkers, a law which contradicts natural law is a rule which remains valid, i.e. part of the legal system in which it was promulgated but it's a rule which no one is bound to obey. For other natural law thinkers, a law which contradicts natural law is a rule which is invalid because it is overridden by the higher or fundamental natural law. This latter was Aquinas's view. In his commentary on Romans chapter 13, Aquinas argues that human authority is derivative from God's authority. As such, a human king can no more overrule God's commands than a proconsul can overrule an emperor's commands. In consequence, human laws cannot overrule either natural law or divine law. Well-framed human laws are therefore shaped by natural law and divine law. Human laws which are not so shaped are defective and deformed because such authority as the human laws properly have is derivative from God's authority. More recent thinkers, 
whether Catholics like John Finnis or Protestants like Herman Doiverd and John Montgomery have tended to think about natural law in terms of human goods and human flourishing. Good laws promote human goods and human flourishing. Bad laws harm human goods and impair human flourishing. Such thinkers acknowledge that it's proved difficult for human beings to agree on the content of the natural law and that work has to be done to move from what we see in creation to determining what the laws ought to be. So John Warwick Montgomery says in Human Rights and Human Dignity, the orders of creation are a reality, but it's not enough to know that the family has been instituted by God. One must be able to determine whether polygamy and polyandry are assets or liabilities to human dignity. Herman Doyavert makes the same point slightly differently. He argues that whatever its usefulness as a part of morality, natural law is not law, properly speaking, binding on human beings until it has been positivized. That is to say, until it's been translated from moral principles into binding rules, given specification and effect by human authorities, whether legislators or judges. So the command may say, do not steal but we still need lawmakers to spell out what counts as stealing, whether taking something away and not returning it amounts to stealing, or whether it only amounts to stealing if you had the intent not to return it, for example. So although natural law theory condemns laws which contradict the natural law, uh, Christian natural law thinkers have always recognized the need for positive laws to uh, specify uh, how the natural law is going to be applied in practice. What's more, Christian natural law thinkers have always also recognised the need for positive laws to permit some actions which are morally wrong, because the price of prohibiting them would be too high. So according to Aquinas, well-framed laws must tell the truth about the communities they are to regulate. Laws should be possible both according to nature and according to the customs of the country. Precisely because human law is established for the collectivity of human beings, most of whom have imperfect virtue, human law does not prohibit every kind of vice from which the virtuous abstain. Rather, human law prohibits only the more serious kinds of vice from which most persons can abstain, and especially those vices which inflict harm on others, without the prohibition of which human society could not be preserved. He makes the point this was true even of the law of Moses, which permitted divorce and some forms of slavery, though not chattel slavery. We may think in modern terms about uh, the uh, American experience of prohibition and ask a question whether that was an attempt to impose a law which uh, was not uh, in conformity, uh, not capable of being complied with by most people in America and therefore ultimately failed. The contemporary thinker Oliver O'Donovan has argued, even at its best, public right action can only bear an indirect relation to the demands of truth and goodness considered absolutely. Justice in human communities is only relatively just. It's not mistaken to think of political authority by positive law or by other means as applying the principles of natural law to social life. But applying is a sufficiently broad term to cover any kind of conscientious attempt to make action correspond to the demands of right. But this application is something rather different from what is involved in individual moral decision. So what he's saying there is it's one thing to ask, what's the right thing for me to do as an individual? What does the natural law require me to do? It's a different question when you're a legislator to ask, bearing in mind the natural law, how do I apply that given the context of the community I'm dealing with? And that question gets sharpened when we think about how Aquinas is suggesting that the law needs to tell the truth, not only about the natural law, but also about the capacities and behaviour and tendencies of the society it's supposed to govern. Legal positivists argue that in order to get our thinking straight about law, we need to ask two entirely separate questions. Question one, is this a valid law within this legal system? Question two, is this law just? For natural law theorists, what distinguishes law as a category of rules is that the laws claim to be just. A rule which makes no such claim is not a law. Laws claim to be just because in order to follow a law effectively, you need to understand its point, its purpose, its objective. Having some understanding of why the law thinks it would be a good idea of you, for you to do X 
is a necessary part of understanding why you should do X. Because all laws claim to be just, any rule whose claim to be just wholly fails is not a proper law. For some natural law theorists, that lack of any connection between law and justice means the law should be regarded as invalid. For others, the law remains technically valid, but it's devoid of any authority. It should not be obeyed on its own terms.